Welcome everybody to the uh, third uh, webinar in our uh, series. So redefining, redefining resilience through innovation across the value chain is the uh, subject of today's webinar. So thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, it was great to have, I'm sure some of the same people on for the first and second webinars last week and we had some great questions and feedback and look forward to the same sort of interaction today. Um, so we've got really uh, incredible opportunities and challenges before us as, a, as an industry. Um, innovation and collaboration through the supply chain are going to be critical for us um, to overcome or manage uh, these challenges, but more importantly, capture value from the opportunities. And that's going to be the focus of, of today's discussion. MLA's value chain information and efficiency programs uh, enable increased productivity and product value across the supply chain with this focus on you know, fostering industry prosperity. So investing in things that uh, are going to uh, allow us to create and capture more value across the supply chain. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Jane Weatherly, who's the CEO of Integrity Systems Company. Uh, Jane's going to facilitate the session and she'll also speak about how you can drive your business forward by turning data into decisions, so using the information we collect to make better decisions. Uh, Ed Morton, from Rap he's the RapiScan Chief Technology Officer. He's going to talk about enabling supply chain feedback. Then producer Jenny Bradley will tell us uh, how to optimise supply chain performance using the Livestock Data Link. And then David Packer, who's the Meat Sanders Australia Program Manager will present on eating quality and connecting that information through the supply chain. So welcome to all our speakers. At the end of today's session, there'll be an opportunity for questions as part of a Q&A panel discussion. Uh, you type your questions into the Q&A feature, which is on your Zoom toolbar. So depending on what system you're using, where that actually sits, but just find the Zoom toolbar and there's a Q&A feature there. You can just type your question into that. If we don't have time to answer all the questions during the session, we'll uh, get answers for those and put them on the updates website. So the updates.mla.com.au website and we'll publish the uh, answers to any of those remaining questions along with the recording of today's webinar, which we'll uh, post up in the next couple of days. If there's any major technical challenge, uh, if we need to restart, we'll send you a new link if we need to. Uh, so far it's been working okay. So hopefully everybody's connection holds up and look forward to the discussion. So over to you, Jane. That's great. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, well, welcome everyone. It is uh, really fantastic to see you all here today. Um, we do have a great lineup of speakers for you, all focusing on how data supports resilience across the supply chain. But first, I'll give you a quick snapshot on MLA data, how we are managing it, um, and give you a short case study on how data can be used to build industry resilience. Um, next slide and next one. Thank you. So at MLA and the Integrity Systems Company, we manage a whole host of data. Um, the National Livestock Identification System database is our largest database and a significant asset to our industry. It currently contains around 272 million tags which is tags that, it's owned, that are owned by our producers um, and have recorded more than 325 million movements over the last 15 years. We capture around 33 million new movements every year. So that is a, a database that is moving rapidly um, and generating significant amounts of information. Within our, our Livestock Production Assurance Program, we have over 190,000 accredited producers and we have conducted more than 33,000 audits since the program began. Our newest digital system, the Electronic National Vendor Declaration, um, is generating new consignment data all the time. Um, and to date, we have more than 260,000 consignments which have used the system and more than 50,000 forms with that. And then there's our animal health data. So we've got there 320,000 data points that we have to date. Um, this is another new area which we're starting to move more into um, and we'll zero in on that shortly. Next slide. 
So MLA uh, manages a number of other significant data sets on behalf of industry, industry with our industry data platform. Some great examples include our Meet Standards Australia data with more than 30 million records of carcass data, um, our sheep genetics with more than 9 million records, um, including 155,000 genotypes. Um, we also have our sale yard data, which informs our market information. And this includes 15 million sale yard records that we have, which are single pen lots collected at a sale by our MLA livestock market offices. So what we're doing now is to um, is working towards making, uh, looking at ways that we can actually link all those relevant data sets together and get it presented in an easy to use format and use, um, use it to really demonstrate industry insights um, on our performance, um, look at ways of informing our R&D priorities and also our extension and communication activity. Next slide. So with all this talk around data and the huge, huge responsibility that we have around managing it all on behalf of industry, we have a big obligation to ensure that it's being used appropriately, um, that we maximise the value from it and that we have people that can use it and that we have the best systems for analysis and importantly, security. Our company data strategy has these five pillars which are presented there, which outline firstly data governance systems and how it can be used and accessed. So access is a, a really important um, issue for us and it's, it's never gonna be a free for all and there's um, stringent rules around all of that. The next priority is around data capture and enrichment, which is about finding the best ways to maximize the information and insights we can get from the data itself. The data culture and capability is an, an essential element to ensuring that we have people within the supply chain with the skills to use the data that we have, um, along with supporting the development of data scientists who really understand our industry and can get relevant data analytics in place for improving performance. The final area there is ensuring world-class infrastructure and to ensure maximum security and that the system is built using solid hardware and software systems. Next slide. So let's have a look now at animal health data and how it supports decision-making and resilience. Next slide. Under the Health for Wealth program that we have, we are now conducting red meat pilots um, and trials. So this uses nearly 550,000 animal disease records, which are being made available to producers and feedlots via the Livestock Data Link program or by different processor owned company-based feedback systems. Why is this important? Well, meat is condemned um, and meat that is condemned for, um, from the beef sector alone costs processes around 11.8 to $50 million per year. From a producer perspective, previous research has shown that health conditions can affect carcass weights and also daily, daily weight gains. Using the example of liver fluke, um, for one abattoir, there was a loss of nearly 450,000 due to reduced carcass weight uh, and to producers as well over a three month period. And this equates to an annual loss of nearly $1.8 million. So Livestock Data Link provides a basic report back to producers where they can find out the number of head with a condition and also the percentage that were affected. This means that producers are able to proactively prevent and also manage the disease and ultimately improve profitability. Effectively, what it provides is a chance for everyone to have a look under the bonnet, if you like, and see what's going on. Next slide. So at an individual level, there is an opportunity to track performance over time around animal health. Um, benchmark yourself against others. If you don't have a livestock data link account, I really strongly encourage everyone to have a look and, um, and make sure that you get one, particularly in light of the fact that you, you may actually have animal health data and other data sitting there that's available, which would really benefit your business. We recently sent out an email to people who do have animal health data available. So please check in to see if you're one of those really lucky people. It is really easy to access that data um, and we'll post in the chat what you need to do shortly. Um, and also we'll have it at the ready on the MLA website with further information following this session. So I strongly encourage everyone to get onto it. It's a great information to have. Uh, at an industry level, um, it is super exciting as well because we can start to generate heat maps with that data um, on particular health issues at any one time. And if there's hot spots brewing, we can target our communications and extension programs accordingly to help producers to manage that issue 
um, a lot faster. So that's really a very quick snapshot of, of MLA data and um, how we're managing it. Um, and I guess how we're really starting to drive towards making sure industry can maximize the, the value from it in a really carefully managed way and, and making sure that we keep it secure as well. So let's now move to Jenny Bradley, our producer, who is actively using data within her business through Livestock Data Link to track and improve performance. So welcome to you, Jenny. Thanks, Jane. Uh, thanks to MLA uh, for the invite to give a producer perspective on Livestock Data Link or LDL today. So along with my husband, Craig, we run a mixed farming enterprise here in the central western New South Wales um, around a small village at Armatree. So basically commercially running um, merino ewes um, and producing first cross ewe lambs to usually sold to a repeat buyer and the weather portion go over the hook. Um, we also turn off a um, seed stock ram um, production system, um, which is performance recorded. So today I've got three key messages that for you to take home. As producers, we already produce a lot of data on farm, which we generate, um, and we receive information back on that data, which drives our business. However, there are gaps in that data at the moment. The types of data, the second point, the types of data that LDL um, provide us with um, include carcass health and consumer feedback. The third point I'd like to convey today is that we as producers are all influencers. So I'll go to my first slide. Just a, a eclectic mix of pictures there that I've taken over a period of time. But you can see there the merino ewes. That wool produced by those merino ewes um, generates a lot of information back to us as producers. And we're all aware of all that. That's um, your yield, um, strength, length, uh, VM. So a lot of data back on those. Here, we're, we, our business also generates a lot of information around reproductive traits in those ewes. Um, at scanning time, twin singles, triplets, dries. We also have a data set around lamb performance in paddocks on how they perform. So a lot of data around those which are collected. Um, you'll see there's some rams pictures, but it doesn't matter whether you're at terminal, 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 marina, terminal or merino or maternal, um, we all generate as breeders, generate a lot of information, which we feed back into sheep genetics. And then that in turn, when that information comes back to us, that drives our breeding objectives and our business, which adds resilience to our business. Also on there, there's um, second cross lambs and carcasses. And this is the whole in my production um, process at the moment, in that we don't receive a lot of information back on those carcasses. We may receive a weight, um, a fat depth, and maybe um, an incurrence like seed infestation. So a lot of information missing there. I've also thrown in a logo there. Uh, we belong to a um, prime land marketing cooperative, uh, 100 producers in that. I see that as a, an excellent, uh, the perfect platform for LDL to operate in under a producer group and information we receive back um, to drive and benchmark against one another within that business. At the moment, LDL, I believe, doesn't pass my pub test. And I'm, by the way, I'm at the pub at the moment because my internet down the road is not good enough. So I'm in, within my pub at the moment. Generally, I can walk in to, in a, into my pub on a, on a night and pretty, most of them are pretty astute lamb producers that I walk into into the crowd, but none of them know what LDL is. Um, so there's a huge gap there for LDL. Um, it's also a missing link within our business. Uh, the next slide, please. I'll just diverge from LDL at the moment and take a deep dive um, into some genetics. So we as seed stock producers um, ourselves are working at the moment on um, eating quality. Now, eating quality traits have been available for us to make selection on since 2016. And eating quality traits include the lean meat yield, intramuscular fat and shear force. We have been, um, through genomics and um, TSUs, which are uh, pictured there, we can select on those traits. Um, so that's the standard practice within our business since 2016, is to drive that and selection process for meat-eating quality traits. Um, 
I thought it was pretty futuristic when I when 2016 when we first started doing it. I didn't think it was applicable at all to our business. However, during that year, I had a phone call from a obviously a pretty astute first cross year buyer asking the status of our first cross years, which were coming up for sales, around meat eating qualities. So that blew my mind. Um, so I it wasn't futuristic. LDL is not futuristic. It's sort of here and now, and we need to um, get that information and use it to drive our businesses. So the next slide, please. So what is LDL to us? We see the, the, the four icons which are shown there, which is lean meat yield percentage, carcass compliance, animal disease and defect, um, and the cattle. I'll park the cattle at the moment. We don't have cattle, so I not I can't speak on that, but I'll speak on the three that are key to my business and most producers' businesses dealing with sheep. Um, lean meat yield is pretty straightforward. Um, the Dexter machines are in place at the moment um, and operational. The pathway along with eating quality traits when in place with lean meat yield will enable us as producers to breed the animals that our customers want and give them a pleasurable, a pleasurable experience in, in consuming that product that we produce. So we can select genetically already on meat eating qualities. So it's good times for us. Carcass compliance, however, I only receive a, I don't know, most producers would only receive a one pager at the moment. So that sort of data is really limiting. With LDL, however, there'll be a huge array of information that will come back um, to us as producers. And um, fat depth, carcass yield, lean meat yield, um, weights, health data, which Jane just touched on, um, which I'll cover off as well. MSA performance will also come back, plus additional reports that can be generated, reports such as compliance. And just a simple compliance is, um, report is the percentage of carcasses that hit weight compliance within that processing plant. It's the one, it's a non-compliant carcasses that I'm interested in as a producer. So we work on lifting averages all the time. So those non-compliant animals as they come back to us, need to know, we need to know why, how, and how we can get them into compliant and benchmark against our own business and other business, other, other producers as well. Um, also, interestingly too, that we'll be able to trace and um, as a producer, use our pick to trace consignments of animals. And I'll touch on that in a minute too. Also, using the pick information, a change in, say, genetic direction within our business or a feeding strategy, we will be able to um, compare those kills across um, consignments, which is pretty, pretty, pretty exciting for us to do. Um, the health and defect, again, Jane touched on this, and I think it's um, a fantastic platform. In particular, I can say, we don't, we, we don't receive that much information back on kills at the moment. However, into the future, if those kill that kill data on around disease and defect is delivered to say LLS regions and in particular the vets within those regions, on a simple disease such as sheep measles, if if they can identify within a certain area that there's been an outbreak through LDL information that comes back to them, they should be able to um, run education days um, and education and eradication programs to deal with that disease, which affects us all. Oh, some of us, not all of us. Um, the next slide, please. So customers are king, and they are too. This is just a, um, a diagram showing that the flow of information is between all along the supply chain. And so it's forward, backward, and it should be too. I've stuck producers in the middle because I think they're the most important people, but... That's only my perspective for today. But producers should have a flow of information between new buyers or RAM clients. Um, and that's a two-way flow of information. Also, that information should be from producers to um, processes and vice versa from processes back. One particular example I like to use is lifetime performance. Um, at the moment, we, well, I'll give you an example. We had um, two lots of two drops of weather lambs and over the last two years during the drought that were actually sold as at 12 weeks of age and weren't taken through to, to the heavier weights. They were sold on to finishers, which then were sold on to processors. We lost all that information from those two drops of lambs. If our pick was in place, um, we would be able to request feedback on those lambs from the processor to see how they performed at the processing point. 
So an important amount of information, an important part of our information has been lost because we didn't have that. Um, but with LDL, we will have that um, track the traceability. So LDL will, will actually deliver that link between our customers and currently that we do not have. And I refer to LDL as the missing link. It will fill a huge void within our um, businesses. The, fifth, the next slide, please. So I've got here, every producer has an important role to play in the supply chain and we're all influencers. I didn't think we influenced the supply chain very much at all. And from, a, from an individual business perspective, I thought it was very, very small. However, when you think that we actually produce rams, you take one ram who's joined to say 50 ewes, produces um, 60 lambs a year, 120 lambing, 120% lambing. Um, for five years, that ram is productive. So that's 300 progeny that that ram will have. You multiply that over 200 rams that we um, breed ourselves, that's 60,000 lambs a year that we, um, that we have an influence over. Also, that's not including the ewe lambs that are retained. So it's exponential. So it's quite a large amount of animals that we have an influence over. So, um, as a producer, you can imagine the, the gains that we could make if the data we receive is leveraged to, to produce positive outcomes to our customers. We're all influencers and livestock data link is the missing link. And it will allow us to benchmark and in turn drive our businesses and add resilience to our businesses. So the last slide there is those three key messages that I've delivered today. There's a lot of data that we already collect and is being collected on farm and a lot of information comes back. Um, and livestock, livestock data link will actually help fill that void, that missing link in that information that's coming back on farm. Three types of data that can be collected by livestock data link or LDL, carcass, um, um, customer feedback and the health data, which is so important. And the third one, Every producer has an important role to play in the supply chain. We're all influencers. So that's an important take home message. And thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, Jenny and her family are, are, have such a fantastic business and a brilliant example of um, a business that's really using data to track their own performance and um, truly industry, uh, truly impacting on industry performance overall. So thanks, thanks very much, Jenny. So now from a on-farm data focus, we now move to a supply chain focus. I'd love to give a warm welcome now to Ed Morton from RappiScan, who is here to give us some insights uh, into the supply chain feedback and the ARM Tech program. So over to you, Ed. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Jane. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. So uh, RapidScan's core business is in the airport. So we normally look at baggage and, and airplanes, that kind of stuff. So the question is, how do you translate that kind of technology to a completely different sector, in this case, the red meat industry? So instead of uh, looking at bags and airplanes, how do we look at uh, you know, sheep and cattle? If you look at uh, automated explosives detections, you can see up in the top left where we found a, a, an explosive material and colored it red. How do we translate that down to uh, lean meat yield to um, into muscular fat? How do we uh, translate that to eating qualities or, or grading scores? How do we turn that back into uh, structural information that can aid the rest of the industry to, to, to more uh, productively uh, cut the animal uh, and process that animal into, into the packages that the consumer will, will be happy to, uh, to receive? So using this kind of equipment, such as the aviation version that you can see in the middle, can we make that transition and, and add this uh, additional value to the, to the red meat industry? If we can maybe go to the next slide. So the way that we, we sort of see this is we have this uh, link all the time between the producer, how do you value that carcass uh, from the producer as it gets to the processor? How does the processor then establish a good price uh, that the consumer is prepared to pay and feedback uh, to the producer? So in other words, going through that cycle that, uh, that Jenny just talked about. So on the one side, we need to think about uh, the things that drive that value chain. So you know, how do we uh, maximize yield uh, of the carcass? How do we reduce the amount of labor 
that is required to process that carcass or, or, or even to grow that carcass or to grow the animal. And how do we uh, ensure good product consistency to allow producers to get a, a, a consistent price for their, for their product? And can we do this with a way that reduces the amount of training that has to be provided to uh, abattoir staff, for example, so that we can make people more productive in the, in the basis that there is always quite a high labor churn in these areas. We also need to think about, do we need you know, small systems or large systems? Do we need abattoir systems, farm systems? So there is different parts in the value chain where again, we need to look. And this is one of the areas that we've been working on with the ArmTech program and MLA generally. So on the one side, we need to think about this from an imaging perspective, using imaging to capture carcass data uh, and also live animal data. And then how do we use that, that three-dimensional data to drive automation to, to support the, uh, the yield uh, and uh, consistency uh, uh, drive? If we move to the next slide. So here are some examples. These are x-ray images that you can see on the left-hand side of the uh, shoulder uh, of a lamb. To the, uh, to the top is what we would see from a standard aviation machine that's used to look at uh, baggage. And on the bottom, you can see the uh, technology as we've been re-optimizing it uh, to, the red, uh, to the red meat industry. So here you can see very clear distinction between the fat, which is in a darker gray color, uh, and the, the lean material, which is in the, the lighter gray color, and obviously the bone, which is in the white color. When you look at the graph on the right, you can see the re-optimizations that we've been making uh, uh, substantially improve the accuracy of the imaging experiment, as you can see from the, the image data. So on the right hand, hand side, you can see how we can reduce the fat into quite a narrow range of, of intensity levels and the lean into another set of intensity levels. Together, this allows us to quite clearly separate uh, fat from lean, hence do a lean meat yield um, calculation very rapidly, uh, and at the same time do intramuscular fat and other things. In contrast, on the aviation unit, you can see quite broad uh, bands where there's large areas of overlap between, uh, between tissue and fat. So this reoptimization is where we're taking this to drive the, the objective measurement uh, uh, area. And ultimately, rather than using the somewhat subjective measurements that we have today of things like you know, fat thickness, uh, indents, and, and, you know, and, uh, uh, and you know, pressing the carcass to see how it yields, can we move to more objective uh, grading schemes where there is very little debate about the answer because the answer is generated from numbers rather than from impressions? So this is the direction that we're driving in at the present time. If we move to the next slide. This is a, a slice through a, a three-dimensional image of a lamb carcass. The lamb's head is to the left and the lamb's uh, uh, legs are to the right. So you can see a nice leg of lamb uh, on the bottom right of this, uh, of this image. And you can see the neck region uh, to the left. You can see a bit of the spine and you can see the, rib, uh, the ribs around the carcass. Uh, you can see a bit of the foreleg to the upper left. So the idea here is that we can use this three-dimensional structure to get very precise definition between fat, lean, and bone right throughout the, uh, the whole carcass. This carcass uh, image, the full complete carcass takes around about two to three seconds to scan. So it operates at carcass rates in the abattoir. So there is no slowing down of the abattoir to collect this kind of information if we can integrate the technology correctly. The, the automated analysis routines also run in real time. So by the time we finish that scan, we have a complete calculation of lean meat yield, for example. We can also extract all that dimensional data to get very precise cutting lines between fat and lean, between bone and tissue, and so on. And by using the imaging both to guide the automation and by using the imaging to derive carcass um, value, it, it gives, um, I think, good justification for kind of putting this, this type of technology into the, into the abattoir and into the farms. If we can go to the uh, next slide. So the idea is that we need to think about this from the perspective of the producer. So is it possible, for example, to scan a lamb or, or, a, or a calf at an early stage of their growth, you know, uh, quite soon after they've been born? We should be able to look at them, see do they have any, any health detriment that should be uh, either treated or should we terminate the, the, the animal at that stage? 
we can then also look at that and say, are they a small animal, a large animal? We can start to establish a growth plan for that particular animal in terms of you know, which paddocks, which feed, which water, and so on. We can then scan that same animal at the mid stage of their development. Uh, if there's any need to revise the, uh, the plan, that that can be done at that stage based on this three-dimensional um, carcass valuation data. We can then scan the animal at the late stage, you know, check is the animal pregnant, for example, should there be any final preparation before we take that animal to the, uh, to the sale yard? Uh, in the, as prior to the sale yard, can we generate a full three-dimensional um, you know, set of data that, that, that combines with all the other information you have about the animal to drive the, the valuation of that, that carcass or that animal at the sale room? From the producer side, uh, once they've uh, acquired the animals, they, they, they can scan in the feedlot. Uh, to make sure that they, the animal has been fed and fattened to the correct level uh, uh, to be ready for slaughter. We can look at the, the final yield for each carcass, which comes back down to the information to the producer, which is, is very valuable. And we can also use the, animal about, the information about each particular animal to start to plan the production strategy. So, you know, how, how many ribs, you know, uh, and so on, are we going to cut from each animal to, to meet our, our order book from, from our customers? Once the uh, animal has been uh, through the kill floor, we can look at it um, again in three dimensions once the animal has been uh, uh, cut into, for example, beef sides or, or a carcass. We can look at that while the, uh, while the carcass is still hot, because we can differentiate fat from lean while the carcass is still hot, in order to, again, refine the production plan. Once the, animal's been the, well, once the carcass has been into the chiller and back out again and drives, uh, drives uh, into the boning room, Again, we can use that three-dimensional information to, to drive the, the plan for automation and to, to cut precisely each particular carcass. Once the, uh, the boning room operations have been completed and that uh, uh, packaged product is available in, in the, ready to ship to the customer, we can run a complete box of product, for example, through a, a system to do the final product QA, to look at eating quality, to look at uh, fat thicknesses, uh, to look and see, you know, did we pack sausages instead of, um, you know, prime rib, for example. So we can just do those basic uh, QA things before the, uh, before the package of product leaves the abattoir. And then the retailer should be able to do incoming product QA exactly as the abattoir would have done outgoing. The retailer can do the same measurements incoming to verify the, uh, the packing list and so on. Uh, and include into that the objective measurement to provide any additional labeling uh, and other, other information they wish to provide to their customer. So by using this kind of three-dimensional imaging, we can add a lot of data into the supply chain uh, at many stages from the very early stage all the way to very late stages in the process by looking at scanning in the field, scanning in the abattoir and scanning in the retailer. So this is an R&D program. The first um, systems we're going into uh, live abattoir settings over the next few months. And then we'll really start to see how can that drive uh, automation and how can it drive uh, processing uh, and, and, uh, and, and the whole area of objective measurement. So that, with, with that, uh, I think happy to hand on to, to Dave. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ed. Some um, unbelievable technology there that's providing great insights on um, automation quality and speed of data that can be generated for carcass valuation and taking it to a whole new level. So we'll now move to um, being even more specific on the supply chain data side of things and focus on Meat Standards Australia and how it's driving greater value across the supply chain. So welcome to our David Packer, MLA's uh, Program Manager for Meat Standards Australia. Over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Um... Um, and thanks all for uh, joining us today. Um, so I'm, um, uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the success of the MSA program over the last couple of decades, but more importantly, how the MSA program is going to underpin a resilient, robust uh, and sustainable um, future of the industry. So the MSA program has three key focus areas, uh, the first of which is the, uh, the research and development component. Uh, and MSA uh, has an ambition of realising all livestock pathways being eligible for MSA grading. 
but it's not only just uh, the livestock pathways. We're also looking for um, uh, new uh, new traits and ways of measuring uh, eating quality as well. Um, we then have a component of the team uh, focused on business growth across the supply chain. Um, looking first at the on-farm component, um, we uh, are working closely with producers to help uh, implement uh, or understand data and implement uh, change on farm to help get a better uh, outcome um, from the stock that they're, uh, they're finishing. Uh, this isn't just in isolation, the MSA program, but working closely with the uh, on-farm adoption team, for example, or the genetics team within the MLA business unit and supporting those producers over the longer term. So we actually get that practice change uh, and, and a, an outcome uh, for industry. Moving off farm, we're working closely with processors, uh, brand owners uh, and wholesalers or end users, um, helping support uh, to um, help them extract the most value from the cattle populations they're harvesting. Um, and also supporting uh, in market um, education and marketing uh, programs as well. Uh, we then thirdly have a robust uh, integrity program. So it's essential that um, uh, we uh, remain the, the most trusted um, uh, protein source. Um, and this is critical because consumers are actually the only ones um, putting um, uh, money into the, uh, into the value chain. Uh, therefore, it, it's critical that we are meeting their expectations or exceeding their expectations. And the results of the MSA program over the last two decades have been very, uh, uh, very uh, promising. Um, over uh, over the last five years, for example, uh, sorry, over the last decade, for example, we've been working closely with producers to uh, improve their eating quality outcomes. And you can see here on the screen uh, the MSA. Uh, index improvements we've seen. And last year we had the highest MSA uh, national average of 58.03. Uh, we also had the uh, uh, returned $172 million uh, back to the farm gate within the last financial year and over $800 million uh, back to the farm gate over the last five years. Um, so that's um, uh, investment from industry, but returning um, almost tenfold back to the, uh, to the uh, stakeholders. Moving forward, uh, as I said before, we've got an ambition of um, realising uh, all livestock pathways uh, to be MSA eligible. And you can see in the top left there, we've got a, a photo of um, a train with some livestock carriages. Uh, and this is part of a project to uh, understand the eating quality impact of uh, consigning um, um, cattle uh, through rail transport. Um, we're also looking at other, um, uh, other um, uh, cattle types and, and production systems, such as how to get efficiencies from um, dairy beef programs or maximising their return on investment from um, cull cows and in balancing eating quality uh, and economic inputs. We're also looking at um, devices and, and instruments that can uh, help us uh, measure carcass traits. And, and Ed, in the previous pr uh, presentation, uh, detailed one of those. Uh, and you can see I've got uh, some cross sections of, of lamb carcasses there. Um, we're looking for devices that can measure um, intramuscular fat or, or marbling levels, uh, not only in lambs, but in beef. But in lamb, um, it will actually uh, be an enabler of a, a, a Meat Standards Australia cut by cook uh, grading model as opposed to the current uh, MSA sheep pathways. Um, but it's not only looking at existing traits uh, in carcasses, but also looking for new traits uh, that can maybe help uh, predict uh, eating quality with more accuracy uh, or measure non-compliance. Uh, and this isn't just on the carcass, but uh, also um, uh, possibly live animals. So we can actually manage uh, those animals appropriately uh, based on those uh, measurements. The eating quality uh, graded cipher was launched in uh, 2017 and it provides um, processors and brand owners the ability to pack um, um, various cuts of the, uh, the, the uh, carcass, uh, uh, graded cuts of the carcass under an eating quality cipher uh, and an MSA program cipher. So uh, rather than packing the, uh, the cuts under dentition uh, based ciphers, uh, which actually has uh, little relevance to um, or relationship to the uh, eating quality outcomes, uh, we can now pack based on what the eating quality outcome of those cuts uh, will be. 
Um, we've now got uh, over 50% of the MSA licensed processes are uh, utilizing this um, uh, cipher in some manner in their business. Uh, and this is a focus for uh, growth in extracting further value uh, across the supply chain in years to come. I touched on it briefly before, but uh, one of the enablers of a, a sheet meat cut space model will be a, a device which can, or devices which may be able to detect a uh, intramuscular fat levels in sheep. So currently we're only, we have a sheep meat pathway uh, and this provides, I guess, an in or an out um, for a full carcass um, uh, into the MSA program. The sheep meat cut space model will actually provide a, a mechanism to um, um, provide an eating quality prediction based on a cooking method uh, for a range of different cuts in the carcass. So uh, similar to the, uh, the beef grading model. So this will allow um, processors and brand owners to actually extract even further value um, from the lamb carcass uh, by able to provide a, a graded product or an even a better product, a four star or a supreme product or a five star. So extracting that further value from, all, from those cuts in the carcass. And equally as importantly, we'll be able to identify the product um, that, that's predicted to fail. So we can manage that product in an appropriate manner um, and uh, ensure that consumer is getting what they expect uh, or exceeding their expectations. So these are just two um, uh, components of, program, of the MSA program that we're focusing on uh, and ways in which we're gonna extract more value from more cuts uh, in the carcass. Um, we're almost through the, uh, uh, the latest um, enhancement of the MSA beef grading model. So since uh, the program was launched in, uh, commercially in 1998, we've had a number of uh, enhancements or upgrades to the beef uh, grading model. And this one's been the most significant uh, enhancement. And it's a result of uh, 10 years and $12 million worth of uh, R&D. And it's now underpinned by a further 54,000 consumer taste tests. So almost uh, around about a million uh, consumer taste tests under predict, uh, sorry, predict uh, the eating quality outcome um, of the 39 cuts in the beef carcass. Um, so now we've actually got the best accuracy prediction that we've had uh, since the launch of the program. We've almost got double the amount of cut by cook combinations in the MSA model. So that means we're, we're getting further value from what may be considered uh, a secondary cut or some of these new emerging cuts um, and being able to pack that MSA and apply uh, new cooking methods and, uh, such as the low and slow barbecue uh, to those cuts. So we are getting that further value uh, from that carcass. As part of the model enhancement, we've also got a, an enhanced MyMSA platform. So that allows um, stakeholders to get uh, uh, feedback um, and utilize benchmarking and reporting tools to help them understand uh, their current uh, status and where, which levers they can pull to enhance the, um, uh, the outcomes for their business. Uh, and this is a prime example of um, um, investment um, leading to commercial pathways and, and, a, and a fantastic demonstration of realising value uh, across the industry and across the supply chain. All of this is part of the MSA um, plan to 2025. And this obviously aligns with the, uh, the MLA uh, 2025 uh, strategy and importantly, the Red Meat 2030 strategy. And, and the, the MSA strategy is built into two pillars. The first is evolving to drive global growth and value. Uh, and this will be one of the key programs underpinning the, uh, the target of doubling the value of Australian red meat sales. Uh, and this will be through initiatives such as launching the sheep meats cuts, cuts base model, um, supporting brand owners, um, utilizing the MSA program to underpin their brands and utilize the eating quality cipher, um, helping um, um, uh, supply data across the supply chain and enabling new technologies to measure and predict eating quality and other uh, compliance measures as well. Australia is actually the global leader in eating quality uh, and we're recognised as that through the MSA program. Um, so we're going to partner uh, uh, for uh, across uh, joint research projects for the benefit of the Australian red meat industry. And part of that will too will help um, grow the, uh, the understanding and recognition of the, um, the Australian uh, eating quality language. The second pillar is building on the, the, the strong uh, foundation of the MSA program thus far. Um, again, it, it, it's important that we maintain 
our status as the trusted source of the highest quality protein. Um, this is through our robust integrity program, but also looking for some smart uh, solutions um, to help um, 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 provide efficiencies across that program. Uh, we need to ensure that we are accurately describing the fitness for purpose or the appropriate method of preparing that meat uh, for all the cuts in, in the carcass. Um, and also um, uh, increase the, uh, the livestock presented for MSA through opening up those further pathways. Last year, we had 3.8 million uh, head of um, uh, adult cattle uh, presented for MSA uh, slaughter. So that's the highest number on, um, on record and, and um, enablers such as the eating quality uh, cipher will no doubt um, uh, open up further, uh, further, um, further numbers in the years to come. And then working closely with the, the production supply, supply chain to um, uh, work out strategies and interventions to improving eating quality, such as longer aging periods for uh, uh, export uh, a chilled product. So that's just a taste of um, the MSA uh, initiatives and the strategy. Um, and MSA is one of the important programs which, which will ensure that uh, we are a part of a resilient, um, robust and sustainable profitable uh, red meat industry uh, into the future. So thank you, Jane. Thanks, Dave. Um, MSA is uh, obviously one of the, the greatest industry programs that we've had uh, that's continuing to evolve um, and deliver significant benefits across the supply chain and importantly to our customers. So there we have it, three great perspectives on how data is creating resilience across the um, individual producer level right through the supply chain and our industry. Um, there were some really great insights there on how data is influencing decision making from our Livestock Data Link, driving innovation through the ArmTech program and helping to really enhance industry improvement and profit um, with, our prof with our product um, through the MSA program. So we'll now um, shortly open our panel session to take a few questions, um, but I just want to draw everyone's attention to the evaluation link um, that will be put in your chat function. Um, you'll see it there. Um, it'll also pop up after we finish um, and you'll also get an opportunity um, with follow up as well email um, if you don't get a chance to do it today, but always best to do those do these uh, evaluation questions when it's all front of mind. So um, I think we'll now go to our panel um, and we'll bring back up our three speakers for today. So we've got Jenny, Ed and David and also myself. Um, and we might just go to a question first, which is directed at me um, just as a starting point, lucky first cab off the rank of um, how secure is our MLA data? And I guess it's important to really stress that data security um, has to be a high priority for us. Um, there's certainly some very advanced, well-funded hackers out there um, around the world that are constantly trying to um, fish around and try to disrupt whatever system that they can get access to. So it's important for us to have as many protections in place um, to really reduce that risk as much as possible. So we have many layers of security um, and data protection. Um, our security is based on what's provided through the Amazon Web Services environment, which is considered to be world's best. Um, we do regular penetration tests, so making sure that the, the door is securely locked and people uh, you know, that shouldn't have access cannot have access. Um, and lots of antivirus layers are applied right across the systems. Um, and also, I guess, um, our environment is spread across a number of data centres across Australia and they're locked within the Australian region. So absolutely no data goes offshore at all. So some pretty um, strong security there. And um, it's obviously a, a focus area for investment um, as, a, as a key ongoing priority for us. So thank you for that question. Um, we might go to you now, Ed. There's a question that's come through for you. Um, and the question is, I understand RapiScan is also assisting Australian border authorities with biosecurity. Can you, can you talk about this? Yeah, sure. So um, after we started working with uh, Meat and Livestock Australia around about two, three years ago, um, the Department of Agriculture uh, started to understand what we were doing um, uh, and came to us to ask us whether we could help to use the same three-dimensional X-ray technology we've talked about in the abattoirs and on the field uh, in the postal units, in the airports and other places to scan baggage, packets, parcels and other things coming through, this time for biosecurity risk materials. 
So we, we look at uh, fruit, we look at uh, meat products, we look at fish uh, and fish products, uh, we look at uh, plants and, uh, and vegetables, and uh, we, we may also at some point soon look at some other things like muddy boots and uh, tent pegs and stuff like this that all contain potential biosecurity risks. So we, we already have equipment at, at many sites in Australia, including in at Melbourne Airport, in Melbourne Gateway Facility, Sydney Gateway Facility, uh, and up in Brisbane. By, by using the same technologies that we started to develop for MLA, but, but moving it across into this orthogonal field in biosecurity screening, it gives us this impact of being able to support agriculture and livestock businesses through interception of potentially a, um, a risk product like pork products, for example, with, with swine flu or you know, uh, fertilized eggs that, that could then hatch into something that we don't really want to see on the Australian mainland. So these are kind of big programs that we are, are working on. So we, we ended up by creating a large center of excellence in Sydney. So we now have about 20 staff in Sydney because of the programs that have been funded by MLA uh, and also by agriculture. So it's really transformed the way that we do business from a business that was based in North America to a business that's now based in Australia. Uh, and more recently, we've just introduced a new program with agriculture, this time on wildlife trafficking. So looking at how can we use the same three-dimensional x-ray data to find you know, reptiles, birds, eggs, and other things that are coming through, uh, particularly the, the male pathway uh, for, for these kind of uh, materials. So it's been a big program and uh, yeah, it's been very interesting. That's fantastic. Thanks, Ed. Jenny, one for you. Um, so you obviously use a lot of data in your business. Um, what types of data sets would you recommend to producers wanting to improve their business through data? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and I probably touched on, on that reproduction one um, during the 10 minutes I had. Um, so we, we collect a lot of data around reproduction, reproductive performance, both commercially and um, within the seed stock um, production system as well. So within the commercial business, as I, as I mentioned before, it's scanning at the point of scanning, it's all that data around um, what those ewes are carrying, and then it's um, allocation of those um, of feed requirements according to what they're carrying. It is um, selection of paddocks, which is an important tracking device that we use to make sure that the, that allocation of paddocks is given to the right animal. So twin bearing ewes will need a higher um, um, foo or food on offer. Um, as, it, as lambing approaches. So all that information right up to the point of marking um, and then um, weaning too, even, even the percentage of lambs marked and percentage of lambs weaned, it's all um, adds to that bottom line, that average. And we're always looking at those, what we produce every year and trying to improve that every year on year um, and make a changes accordingly. So um, the other data set, which is an ex probably the best data set we have is around the seed stock um, production system that we have. And it's all using EIDs, um, which I am a huge fan of and commercially that will become part of our business as well. So EIDs within that, the capture of data on an individual animal. And we've got um, a lot of information around that. So that data set drives that part of our business. Um, and we make all our decisions on retention of animals right through to selection of size and use um, all on that data set. So yeah, really important. That's a really good question. So there's two data sets that are important to our business. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Jenny. Um, lots, of, lots of questions coming through. Um, Dave, one for you. Um, we're, we're rapidly running out of time, so we'll just squeeze one more in on um, How's MSA supporting the growth of Australian product in international markets? Yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, look, I touched on it briefly there, but um, one of the key focus areas of the MSA program is a, is a team dedicated to supporting uh, the processes and brand owners in market. Um, I guess eating quality in the MSA program actually underpins a lot of those brands that we are exporting market. So we work very closely with the with the uh, the brand owners and the processors here in Australia to help segregate those brands and extract the, the maximum value from those brands. 
Um, and then we support um, them internationally as well. So that's both through our MLA teams in international markets. So that's through education and uh, education programs, probably more education programs for the, for the end users and wholesalers in those markets. So they understand the differentiation of Australian products and also support the, the brand owners as well with their, their marketing strategies and approaches. Um, and I guess it's really supporting their brand to do their talking. And uh, it's important that uh, a robust um, earning quality system such as MSA is underpinning that. Um, plus, they also include their, uh, their their attributes as well to differentiate themselves as, as well. So it's, um, I guess, it's a, it's a broad uh, team approach, not just the MSA program, but uh, MLA as a whole is supporting both uh, initiatives here in Australia, but also uh, the, the in-market support in our uh, exporting countries as well. Brilliant. Great. Thanks so much, David. Look, I think um, we might just pull it up there and um, I'll hand back over to Jason, but thank you very much to our speakers who provided brilliant insights today. Um, so over to you, Jason. Thanks, Jane. Um, and to the speakers, what a great session. And at the start, when we were talking about you know, the opportunities and challenges, and I think we've got some really good examples of the, uh, the challenges in the amount of data that is available, the amount of data that gets collected across the supply chain, but then the opportunity in being able to use that uh, to create and capture more value. And of course, those great examples from uh, David about the, the value being created by Meat Standards Australia the farm gate and and then hearing that uh, results or the the use of, of the livestock data link system but also i think that jenny highlighted quite rightly the fact that it's still a very widely known so there's a lot of information available a lot of information that we can be uh, capturing accessing and, and getting this message out is certainly a, a key focus of the the team around extension and adoption so thank you for tuning in today's session uh, we certainly appreciate everybody making the time. Um, don't forget there's two more webinars in the series. So leading up to our annual general meeting, which is on Thursday, November 19. Um, you can register for the other webinars if you haven't already uh, on the same website, which is up on the screen now. And as I mentioned to start with, everything will be recorded and will end up on the uh, on that site in the next in the next 48 hours. Jane mentioned the survey, so please um, fill that in. We really appreciate the, the feedback and how these things work and how we can do them better. Uh, and hopefully everybody got some value out of today and look forward to um, being in touch next week or with the next webinar tomorrow and, uh, and the final one next week. So thank you for taking the time today and thank you to our speakers for providing us with such great information. Thank you.